What is good? Oh, we're getting a fresh crack for this one. Jason's been after me about the brand. He's like, I can't drink this many days anymore. I'm 36. <laughs> uh, so this one's for Snoog. How you doing, man? Good to see you again. I'm doing good. You just gave me the chills with that nice cold Modelo crack. So Ooh. it's a good night. Good night to record with the FF Dynasty. It's always a pleasure to be on the show. And I wish I had a Modelo to crack with you right now. It's uh, It's been a long running trademark of the show that we always started off with. We used to rate the crack like a pizza review, but, uh, you know. Like the Dave Portnoy yeah. pizza reviews. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, today we're going to hit the back half of your first round. And we're mostly going to be talking super flex tight end premium because at this point we know sort of what one through seven is. But I want to talk to Snook here because we talked pre-combine and we talked about a lot of these guys but now i think we got a little at least clearer direction until we get the last one of the last pieces in draft capital and landing spots of kind of how in general we feel stacking these guys out and it seems like there's a lot of different ways to do this depending on what you value who you value metrics film yada 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 so uh snoog hit me with kind of one eight through 112 and if 112 value with let's say it's trey benson and brooks bleeds into you know two one to two two feel free to to take it there but uh i'll open the floor to you to one eight here yeah i personally think this is a pretty pretty very weak actually i'd say very weak running back class just in terms of top end talent so yeah. i don't have anyone crack in my top 12 i think it's just going to be jj mccarthy and three wide outs for me i think it's going to be jj brian thomas jr xavier worthy and probably add Nye Mitchell there. I think you could argue Lad, you could argue Troy Franklin, you could argue that as like a tier as that's what I have it in. But just from what I'm trying to project from a draft capital and from a ceiling perspective, I think Brian Thomas Jr., Xavier Worthy, and Adnai Mitchell are the guys that are going to go in the first round. They're going to have that high-end ceiling. They're going to be really good number twos with upside if they hit. Obviously, I just probably a good chance Marv, Rome, Neighbors, and those three all don't end up being really good. Like, there's probably going to be one that busts or two that busts. But from what we know now, I mean, I'm projecting JJ to be a top 12 pick. That's It's hard to not take him eight when that's what's going to happen. Um, there's a chance that even he goes for, for the consensus over a Roma Dunze or a Brock Bowers or a Drake May that goes to the Patriots, right? And then you get one of those guys at 108. So I think the 108 is the most va like valuable pick in the draft with costs included. Because I think you get one of the big eight guys, you're going to get a guy that gets premium draft capital. Because think, if JJ goes top 12, everyone else goes kind of where we project them, and then Brian Thomas goes 17 to the Jaguars to fill in for Calvin Ridley in that number one role, <laughs> we're going to see eight guys with premium draft capital all go top 17. So it's it's looking like 2021 in that sense where it's like, you can't go wrong. It's going to be probably one, 101 to 110 where there's tons of value and there's tons of opportunity to hit on a big prospect. Like I said, Thomas, Worthy, J.J. McCarthy, Adonai Mitchell. You got Ladd. You can sprinkle in there if he goes round one or if he goes to the Panthers and he gets a ton of targets. You got Troy Franklin as another guy. I think – Thomas has the highest ceiling out of any of these guys I just named, just from a being six foot three, two ten, incredible athlete. Started playing basketball or started playing football when he was in tenth grade. He was a basketball player in high school and college, which is really cool to see because he's got that elite athleticism and it shows. Right, it showed on the field. It showed him consistently winning vertically in a high powered offense. And you could probably argue the reason why Daniels won the Heisman and was so good was because of Thomas and neighbors. And then you could also argue it's because of Daniel. So I'm kind of curious where you stand on those four to five ish guys I named and like tier wise, I always like to do tiers, especially when we don't know landing spots, because that just kind of helps me understand like where I value these type of players, what the ceilings are, what the floors are and kind of where their range is in dynasty. Yeah, no, I, 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 I should have included this off the off the jump. Then we're also going to figure out ways to maybe pivot off of these if, if we think that there's a lower end of things. So but first, I wanted to kind of rank these a little bit. Um, and I when we last talk, I, I kind of had Brian Thomas up there. Then I had Xavier Worthy um, and I did have Troy Franklin in there. But Ladd was creeping in for me. And now at this point, I think it's Brian Thomas, Xavier Worthy 
And I, I think I'm putting Ladd in a tier right there with those three guys. Like, I like those three guys a lot. They all kind of do a little different stuff. They all offer, offer different kind of profiles. Mm-hmm. Um, but Troy Franklin's probably been the one that dropped down a little bit. And, I, I, you know, I'd like to say I have a really, really strong reason why. I don't. I think I just like those. Ended up everything projecting a little better than I, than I you know, not that yeah. Franklin did anything wrong by any means. Outside of not performing well, you know, I know people were making a big deal about the gauntlet or whatever, which wasn't great. But it's also the other drills out there weren't great. It all, it all kind of went together. And just the combine, the visual wasn't awesome from Troy Franklin, which, you know, there's already some parts and pieces of his game that I'm like, I really like a lot of these things. Uh, but there were a couple of things where, eh, I don't know. And, I, you know, I just don't. I don't know what his overall route tree, route running prowess is on, on certain things that I think he should be good at. That it, I don't necessarily, I don't know how fluid of a route runner he is. Whereas like somebody like Ladd is is really fluid. You could say the same thing about Brian Thomas. That maybe the negativity is that the route tree isn't super vast. It was a lot of spamming over the middle or going deep, which he is awesome at going deep, and he's pretty yeah. good with the ball in his hands. And then the the you know the testing really put it over the top. I've come more and more around to the fact of, I don't really care about the route tree all that much going into, you know, if you're a talented person and and you're going to work hard and the work ethics there, and you're going to get into the right position, the right spot, the right landing spot and the right coaching staff, then it's not really going to matter. Nobody cares that DK Metcalf didn't have a route tree anymore. You know, there's been Mm -hmm. plenty of those guys over the past few cycles where it was like the route tree is a little limited and it's like, how many routes do I need you to be good at? You know, And, and let, you know, but Again, I'm I'm maybe double counting because I like those parts of Xavier Worthy's game. I like those parts of Lad McConkey's game, and so I'm giving them the 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 benefit of the doubt there of saying the athleticism plus the route tree, you know. And and now we th- I thought that Lad could get vertical a little better than some people thought, and now I think at least that theory's been proven out as far as you know manufactured testing speed uh, the game speed still looks pretty good so i probably have those guys there did troy franklin fall down for you i don't re- quite remember or, or where where does troy franklin stand here and, and did he move down a little for you yeah pre-combine i had i had a tier of three i had it um brian thomas 4a worthy 4b and then i had troy franklin so it's not even that troy franklin did anything to make me say i don't like you anymore you're not good at football it's more like Adnai Mitchell and Lad McConkey had such good athletic testing and they shine so much that I think that like if if Adnai Mitchell goes round one mm-hmm. and we're and Franklin goes round two to like a meh landing spot, it's hard to project him to be a wide receiver. I don't think he has wide receiver one upside in general. Mm-hmm. I think he could be a good two. Yeah. He's almost kind of in that like Rashi Rice type mold for me, like that Rice yeah, Addison yeah. type. Like he could be a good number two, but I don't think he has like that elite ceiling. It, it it's tough. He's like six two one seventy six. He has such like a weird build and mm-hmm. frame and play style. So it's like he's not a guy that you're gonna lean on down after down. It's not gonna be third and five. The whole stadium is watching. Everyone knows the ball is going to Troy Franklin, right? Like. That's not the type of player he is. He's not a Roma Dunze. He's not a Marvin Harris. He's not a Malik Neighbors. He's not even a Brian Thomas Jr. in my opinion. So it's like, I think he's good. I think he has good routes. He, he's nuanced. He, he can play on all three levels. But I think he lacks in the screen game. I don't think he's very versatile after the catch in that aspect. I think he's more of like a straight line runner, can catch it across the middle and burn you at speed. Yeah. But I don't think he's like very nimble and he's not agile in short areas. But I like the release off the line. Can he beat press coverage? I saw, I've saw. i seen that he can, and I've also seen that he really can't, so it's yeah. tough. But and it doesn't really matter as much as it used to because the NFL uses motion at the highest level that it ever has, right? Like players aren't staying stationary. Like they're moving around. They're getting mismatches. Coaches are taking advantage of guys like Xavier Worthy's speed and Zay Flowers and Jordan Addison and getting them lined up on linebackers and safeties, and that's just the NFL today. So I don't think beating press coverage at a high level is the best thing in the world, but I don't think Troy Franklin's like a true alpha X wide receiver. That's going to go out there and just beat people on the outside, like play after play. He's more of that like hybrid number two piece that like you're motioning around, getting them in the slot playing like that. So that's why I've personally leaned towards throwing Adonai Mitchell over him as my six right now. I think today I have it Thomas worthy Mitchell, and then it'd probably be, um, 
uh, Franklin and Ladd. But I think you could literally truly argue like any of those five guys to be your wide receiver four. Like if, if there was five other people on this pod right now and everybody liked one of those wide receivers more than the other, they could give us all a good enough reason to convince us why they're, they're the number four in this class. And that's what's so special about this class, right? That's why we do tiers. Because if Troy Franklin goes pick – whatever to the saints with Derek Carr and he's the number two behind Olave on a, on a gross offense. You're not going to take him over at nine Mitchell that goes 28 to Buffalo bills. And he's like the number two option in the elite offense. It's just, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you have take lock on the player. It's just bad process in my opinion. So it's, there's that staying fluid, right? You got to stay fluid with your process and landing spots matter. If at nine Mitchell goes to a situation where a quarterback can can lean on him and give him those 50-50 balls and throw to him even when he's not open, then he's going to have a whole nether ceiling unlocked with him because he's really good at that. But he needs that quarterback that trusts him, right? He's going to need that certain situation to hit that high level. And like my comp for him was Allen Robinson. I think that's a good comp. Is he going to be Allen Robinson in the NFL? If he is, that's a damn good hit. Mm. That's like an absolute ceiling but just like a fluid mover. He's six, two, he was an elite athlete at the combine. He can jump high. He had like a, what, an 11, four yeah, broad crazy. jump at like a four, three, four forty. And yeah. he was like 205 pounds. So I think that was a good comp. He's not like the best yak player ever. He's really not good at it at all, but he's a good athlete. He can win vertically and he can run good routes and, and separate when he wants to. And that's the big issue with him. But yeah, I saw somebody kind of put, put a, uh, you know, George Pickens esque just kind of, at on field attitude of like can be one of the rawest dudes on the field, but it's, you know, sometimes it's just not always in gear. Uh, which, yeah. You know, I can understand part of it, but then other times it's like, come on, man. I think that's what maybe limits me from having AD Mitchell up in that tier that I kind of had. And then Troy Franklin, just to double back on him real quick before maybe we get to some of these pivots here for, for the back half of this pod, the way you were kind of selling him as the receiver, I, I, I agree with. And, and, one of the big things I had was, you know, how the, the yak numbers for him are solid. Um, he's really tough to catch in the open field because the, the speed's really good. Um, you know, but I just all the yak isn't created equally. So when you look at the yak, you're like, oh, it's pretty good yak. He ranks pretty good. But like you watch a guy like Malachi Corley and that yak is completely different than the yak. Like that guy's an actual yak guy that his Franklin's yak comes from, I caught it over the middle of the field. I'm faster than you. I'm right. You know, he's not tossing guys off of him with that build. So that's, you know, some of, I, I very much agree with a lot of the things you set up with Franklin there. So I just wanted to kind of circle back on that. Um, and I like AD Mitchell, like I said, but I, at this point I would, I think I'm taking AD Mitchell over Troy Franklin. Um, I agree. So, all right, let's, um, Let's find let's find a couple of pivot points here. Now I know we just talked twenty three versus twenty four. I don't know when these videos will come out if they come out back to back or not. So we'll try to stay away from some of the twenty three guys to pivot off of. But you know, again, we talked about it in the twenty three video. We're to the point of the cycle where people are, you know, this class kind of sucks because this, you know, this is just where we get to at this point of the year. Um, but you know, I do. I'm in plenty of leagues where some of the sharper, better guys who stay at the top don't necessarily make a whole lot of their rookie picks. So I think, you know, we do get caught up in the process of rookies and it is, of course, it makes the draft is like the rookie draft is the most fun part of the year. So to not really participate in that isn't that much fun. And you certainly can catch the best value with the most upside, but you can also catch some people willing to sell some assets and sell some things that, you know, have been proven good assets for an if, and, or a maybe. So I think it's always a good idea to, to, uh, talk about both sides of the things and we can do a little and see what's uh, see what's good over here. So we can start at the, you want to st just say JJ McCarthy gets top billing. We say he goes top 10 or maybe even 11 to the Vikings. If everybody stays put and that's where JJ McCarthy goes, if, if McCarthy goes to the Vikings or somebody trades up or whatever, he goes in the top 10. I don't really like McCarthy. He doesn't do it for me. Like, I think he's fine. It's, it's not because that I don't think that they didn't trust him and they, so they didn't throw the ball. It's just what they do. Um, they had a really good team. You know, I, I think he can be good. He just he doesn't move the needle for me where I'm like, oh, I, got, I definitely got to take a pick. I don't know how you feel about it. So if there was, if McCarthy lands at 108, are you pivoting there or are you just going to take your money and uh, and grab you some, some JJ? 
I think getting a quarterback at 108 that went 11 is good. And I think he's a winner. I think he's very poised. Yeah. I think he carries himself well confidence-wise. And I think he can make every throw. Maybe not consistently, but the upside's there. I think he's a guy that you get a bridge guy and you let him sit for six to eight games and kind of let him get a feel of the next level and put things together. And I think he can he can be a guy that's top 15, top like a starting caliber quarterback. I think I'd rather take a J.J. McCarthy 108, 109 than, a, than take a Daniels at 102, right? Because it's like you can turn the 102 into a 105 and a 108 or a 106 and a 108 and get a Bowers and a J.J. McCarthy. So it's all about cost cost value for me. Like if I can get these guys that I don't think are drastically worse and get more and get a guy like Brock Bowers or a Dunze on top, it's a win-win for me. But you can't go wrong. A quarterback going 11th, to the Vikings being Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, and Hawkins and quarterback. I think I, at that point, I think I'd stick and pick yeah. and swing there. And just like, if I miss on the one Oh eight, all right, whatever. Like, you know what I mean? If I miss on the one of 10, whatever, if I miss on the one two, that's going to hurt your dynasty team a lot. So it's cost and cost adjusted there for the, for the quarterbacks, especially in this rookie class. So you got to stick and pick and swing on McCarthy. Would you take the safety and Jared Goff? If you could for that pick, I wouldn't. I think I, I think I'd swing on McCarthy. Okay, how about I don't know where I, you. I would take on like a Dak over it though, or like a, sure. like a Dak or what any of those. Guys. I don't know where you stand on Deshaun Watson, but would you swap out for Deshaun Watson? Because there's a lot of ceiling there. I would take JJ. Mm, I think I'm, I'm taking Watson. Um. Yeah, I, I feel you. I, I think I'd take JJ. I, I think I like JJ too, yeah. though. I think yeah, yeah. he. Fair enough. But, Fair enough. All right, let's let's keep moving down the list. Let's go. Let's. I think we're both kind of at least have Brian Thomas in the same tier of the next guy. So let's say he's kind of the next guy off the board for everybody. So um, Brian Thomas for me that would be you know I could I could pivot to you know the last show we did I said pretty much any of those twenty three wide receivers for me. But how about T Higgins or uh, Brian Thomas for you? Is that what that I would take? Be? T. You take T. Yeah. See, I'm one of those, like, when I come off a rebuild or if I'm hitting the one-year punt and I have a ton of picks, I'm one of those turning all the picks into established players, right? Like, I don't want to get stuck in that rebuild again. I don't want to be stuck in that one-year punt again. Like, think about last year. If you took, like, Quentin Johnston and Bryce Young with two of your picks, if you made every pick and didn't, like, just take – if you didn't want to say – say you had 101, 102, like, 103 and 107, right, and you took – Bijan, Richardson, Bryce Young, and then you took Quentin Johnston. You went two for two on those transactions, at least from like a value standpoint of like what happened with those picks after year one, you're devastated. But if you just trusted and took Bijan and then maybe you traded the rest of the picks into what you could turn the 102, 103, and 107 into, it would be crazy. Like you could get two stud receivers. Like you could have got CeeDee Lamb for the 102 last year at this time. Like, that's how that like Richardson was literally on the cusp of like a late first round startup pick after the draft. So it's like you got to swing there, but you also have to like be able to adjust and not just make every pick in your rookie draft. Like you got to be able to be like, okay, I want to go get Devontae Smith. I want to get Nico Collins. Like I want to build my roster up with these wide receivers that are going to give me top 15, top 20 years. Not everybody can be Justin Jefferson. So you got to think of how deep the landscape is and like, T Higgins, Brian, like you want Brian Thomas to be T Higgins. So, so right. it's like if Brian Thomas ends up being T Higgins and has 3000 yard seasons, you're going to be absolutely stoked, right? Like you're going to be like, all right, my 108, 109 ended up hitting. Like now he's worth a top 12 wide receiver pick because he just has that post year one hype. So it's, you got you to gotta stick and pick with guys that you truly believe in. But for most people, like your wide receiver four, you're probably not taken until like, early 20s maybe late teens in the in the landscape in general at wide receiver yeah how about how about dk you know i don't know if you have tk t over dk or dk over t your same tier or whatever so it's the same kind of conversation but um dk seems to be a guy over the last two years that his value is just kind of perennially just kind of kept sliding down a little bit probably a little bit of a value at this point uh dk or are you, are you sticking and picking I would stick and pick there. Okay. Yeah. I think DK, I think I have Thomas like four or five picks above DK in in the same tier. 
I think that JSN and Lockett hold back DK's ceiling just in their situation. I think DK is a better player than Brian Thomas, but I think Brian Thomas can get there. And in the right situation with the given draft capital that he's projected, I think he could give us a DK-like career so far. All right. How about Kyle Pitts, 1.5 tight end premium or uh, the, that 1.9? So it would be 0.5 bonus, right? right. So it would be like 1.5. I would, I would lean Pitts. Yeah, there we go. I would, the, I would take the upside shot with Pitts there, right? It's yeah. especially in tight end premium. He got Kirk Cousins. He's the clear number two option right there with London. You can even probably argue at 1A, 1B. Yeah. If, he, if he recovers better from that injury, a year removed from it and gets explosive like he was, he could be a beast there. We saw what Hawkinson put up. Pitts can put up the same, so... All right. So would you would you for all of these would you group in Xavier Worthy and AD Mitchell in in kind of all these same conversations? Yeah, I I think I almost want to say as prospects those three are in the same tier, but draft capital wise I think Worthy and Thomas are locks for round 1 and I don't know if AD is, but I think he should be like Today, I would say there's six wide receivers that should go round one, and it's the, those three and then the three that are obvious. And then like like 2022 had six wide receivers in round one, and it was a weak defensive class like this one is. Mm-hmm. This class is not really good from like an NFL perspective. Like it's QB, wide receiver, and tackle heavy, and it's pretty good at DB. But like the edge rushers are weak, and that's where you get a, like you usually get a lot of edge first rushers and picks. defensive linemen that go in, for, in the first round. You got maybe Dallas Turner versus that Laia li- two guy from UCLA, UCLA and then you can yeah. say like Iron Murphy. Mm. So it, it's it's I think there could be six, maybe seven wide receivers taken in this first round. Will there be? We don't know, but there could be. So like you can even argue Lad, you could argue Troy Franklin maybe slips in there, but I think those six have a good chance at going in there. So it's like. It, it landing spots, right? Like DK Metcalf and T Higgins, I would probably take those guys over um, Adnan Mitchell just because I think they're number ones most likely. Like he's leaving. Like he's not going to be a Bengal. They're not going to pay him. He's already on the trade block. He's going to be a one wherever he goes. DK's already technically a one. AD's probably never like a one, but he could get there. But they're already there, and they're young, and they're they're going to get contracts. So it's like. Yeah. So would all right. Um, obviously, I think Pittsburgh is going to end up taking another wide receiver. I do too. They traded somebody, but George Pickens. Does he? Would you be able to uh, pivot off of any of those guys that we're talking about right now? First round nine through eleven ish for for George Pickens, or is that a no no for you? I would. Yeah, I, I really like George Pickens. I mean, he put up eleven hundred yards with Mitch Troub and Kenny Pickett. He got Russ, and I know Russ isn't the prettiest thing on the block, but Court and Sutton had double-digit touchdowns, and Pickens is a lot better. And with the, especially with the skill set he has, he fits that Russell Wilson mold, and now he's going to dominate the targets. Like I think you could argue him definitely over A.D. Mitchell. I'd probably just stick there and try to roll with Thomas and where these upside, maybe hopefully going to, like I said, Jacksonville, Cincinnati, or maybe Dallas. And being like a high end two on a on a stacked roster with an elite quarterback, so I'd probably swing there. But if they end up going to just random landing spots that I'm not super in love with, I'd probably argue Pickens over those guys. All right, let's talk a, a, a few running back free agent winners: Jacobs or Saquon Barkley. You're in a two to three year win now window. Would you trade any of those the same picks one nine through maybe one twelve for either one of those running backs? Saquon, yeah, I'd take Saquon over all those picks. I'd take How far Tom, up would Saquon go for you then, up the up that pick ladder? I think, I think he's probably a little less. I think I'd take, I definitely take like the one one through seven over him. Okay, but maybe I, got, maybe I would get take off McCarthy Roman Brock over. Him. What was that? Could you get off McCarthy for for Saquon? You know, obviously, <laughs> team build. You know, has to. You're not just taking. Barkley, there. That's a specific. I'm ready to go. Build here. Uh, you know, clearly. I think he's going to explode on the Eagles. Mm-hmm. If I get two explosions of a year from him, like two top five years, two top seven years, I think it's worth it to take that shot, right, and try yeah. to win some money. So, 
It's not sexy. The, 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 the value police aren't going to like that, but I mean, sometimes you got to yeah. try to win, right? Yeah. It, it comes down to, do you like donating to your leagues or do you like bringing home the pot? So, right. Sometimes it's, it's, it's gotta be more than a beauty pageant about how my roster looks and mm -hmm. you know, nobody, nobody can make fun of me and my roster. And it's like, well, sometimes you got to yeah. make those moves. Um, all right. Well, I want to, I want to jump back real quick to JJ cause I just got you off him with Saquon, but I want to see if there's, how about Drake London, probably a free agent winner, not because just because he got a quarterback. Would you swap Jake uh, Drake London out for JJ McCarthy? No, I'd take London. Okay. Definitely. Okay. Nico? Yep. I would take Nico. Pittman? I would take Pittman. <laughs> Reluctantly? I'm a big wide receiver guy. Like, I'm one of those, like, I'll – have five wide receiver ones or twos on my roster. Like I will load that position and just take flyers on running backs. Like mm -hmm. yeah, my favorite so. player ever is Kamara. So I'll just own him in every single league and run him with like James Conner and then have like speedy AJ Brown and like Nico Collins Pittman. Like that's how I, how I like to run my teams and yeah. it's worked really well for me. So, sure. all right. So how about, um, Devonta Smith was a name you dropped before we started. Where, where would he rank in the, uh, <laughs> The pivot scale right here. I take him over everybody. We just named yeah everybody, including JJ. Yeah, he doesn't get he doesn't break into the top seven for you. You're still taking Bowers in Rome. I would, but yeah, I would. It's, oh, I just but it's not even a knock on JJ, right? Like it's just, and I think there's a real world if Brian Thomas goes Cincinnati or Jacksonville that I'm taking him over JJ. There's a chance. I I think if JJ goes like if JJ goes to Denver. Like, are you, are you taking JJ in Denver at 12 over Brian Thomas Jr. Mm -hmm. to Jacksonville or Cincinnati? That's like where it comes because that's a realistic outcome, I think right? Two like, years ago, me would have. I would have been like, yeah, give me Sean Payton. But now, like, I've really just fallen out of favor with I just, he feels like a jerk off. And I tell <laughs> Sean yeah. Payton, just, I used to really like him. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you got to be excited about he's going to come in, he's going to implement a system. And it's just like, I don't know, man. He just seems kind of like, yeah. Like a, I think the best thing we can do right now is hypotheticals, right? Because we don't know any landing spots, but we can kind of project based off mocks and what we've seen with the combine, where these guys are going to land. It would be a lot easier, I think, if we had landing spots to compare these guys yeah. to established wide receivers. But still, like you can't go wrong going with top 20 young dynasty wide receivers with good quarterback play. The Devontae Smiths, the Jalen Waddles, like the Drake Londons, the Nico Collins, like just there's upside there you know what you're gonna get you know they're gonna produce for you you're hoping thomas gets there you're hoping worthy gets there you're hoping mitchell gets there right right yeah no so all right winning team again 111 112 would you baker mayfield i'd, I'd take the pick take the pick there I how, about, how about if you're a 112, won the championship, got a good roster? It's not like super old, but it's, it's you know, it's oldish uh, with a couple of young players. Is there any um, older wide receiver that you would go after and say, hey, I just won. I'm, instead of mystery boxing, I'm going to go pick up one of these older wide receivers like Terry McLaurin, 112, especially non super flex. Like that would be somebody that I might go get who, you know, if it gets a quarterback, he's, he's not 29. He's still only 28. He's a year younger than a lot of yeah. those older guys. Is there a couple of those guys that you might be interested in with a later round first and you already have a good team or is that just something that you're just not doing? Yeah, there, there is actually, I'll go a little bit older. I'm a huge Devonte Adams guy still. I think Minshew was the best thing they could have done just for Devonte Adams. I think he's literally going to get 180 targets again. So yeah. he's a guy that I would give 111, 112 up for all day. Just looking at it right. in like a one to two year window. Got to like be roster construction correct, but you know, yeah. not just willy nilly. Yeah. Um, but, but trade I would look for too. Just looking at where I have, I'm I'm really high on Amari Cooper still, and sure. I would love to get Amari in a 25 second for like 111 or 112 or Amari in a pair of thirds, right? Because I, I doubt you would have to give up the 112 or 111 straight up for Amari, especially now that he's in that like 29 to 30 range. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, he's bad now, right? No, he's a consistent thousand yeah. yard receiver. So that's a guy that is very good value that I found myself trading for a lot of. And I, I've gotten him for a pair of seconds. I've gotten him for, I think, the 204 straight up. 
last year was the year I bought him in a lot of leagues for like early to mid seconds. And I was just like, I'll take it all day and look at the year. He 52 fantasy points. Yeah. He did the job. I don't care what that second turned into. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we're, we're getting at the end of this thing here. Um, I did want to touch on like, how about like guys like Rashad White, James Cook, maybe even a Tajay Spears little free agency. You know, you knew they were going to bring somebody in. I, you know, but if it's Gus, if it's Gus Edwards, then you're ecstatic about Tajay Spears. But it's Tony Pollard, so you're like, ah, eh, it's kind of a little weird. What do we do? Like, would those guys be any? You know, are which direction would you go or none of either getting the pick for them or trading them for those picks? Kind of where you stand on on that kind of, you know, those guys right now are like seventh-ish round picks for an RADP super flex tight end premium. And maybe mm-hmm. Spears might go down a little because people aren't excited about Tony Pollard being there. So um, what do you think about those kind of fringy kind of weird running backs, but still can be very valuable for you? Yeah, those three actually just made it on my dynasty sales list. Like I said before, this 2025 running back class is loaded out the gills. Like there is so much talent there. It's very deep. There's probably going to be guys that go back to school for 2026, but you got Judkins, you got John D, you got Ollie Gordon, you got Travion Henderson, Devin Neal. Like it, you could name 10 guys that are starting caliber running backs. The Rashad Whites, the James Cooks, the all those guys are going to be in trouble, especially when they – decide uh they're getting towards the end of their deal give me a guy like quinshawn judkins in round two that's Mm going to be that prototypical workhorse back that white can maybe be a three like a third down back four right so it's like those guys i'm trading off of i would rather go take a camara a joe mixon a derrick henry and get a plus on top of those guys and tear off the james cooks and the rashad whites because I've seen people have James Cook in like their top 12 dynasty running back rankings. And I get it. He's young. He had a good year. Let me go check my make sure I'm not one of those guys. <laughs> no, no, I, I get it. Like people have it. And honestly, he's he's up there for me. I think he's literally probably in that like top 15, but it's like sell him. Take advantage of that that value. He's on the bills. Like sell high on that. Go get a veteran guy. Like I like to look at this landscape. We talked about that window. In that one to two year window, like get a mix in that's going to give you the similar production for the next two years. And then you know what's going to happen. Like, you know, he's going to whatever fall off in value, but you can almost guarantee that th- the Bills bring in another back or the Bucks bring in another back. Cause like those guys, like they need to bring, like, w- these guys are going to need to find landing spots. Right. And it happened with the 2023 class. Like, Jameer Gibbs just robbed DeAndre Swift, who everyone thought was an elite dynasty running back, myself included, for a while. So it's you always got to look at that type of stuff. And and nobody's job safe, especially when you get to the third and fourth round um, draft picks like Rashad White and and uh, Tajay Spears and stuff. We already saw Tony Paul get brought in on a big deal. So right. there, there goes <laughs> Tajay Spears' season. And I was one of those guys that thought he was going to have a good year. And he yeah. still can, yeah. but... I think the running back position is just so, so volatile. So take advantage of selling high on guys coming off career years. Like Rashad White and Cook both have phenomenal seasons. You could get a first for them. Take advantage of that. Yeah, and speaking of what we were talking about with the wideouts, Marquise Brown to the Chiefs. Literally, as we're Did on that really here, just fucking another, happened? another big move. Woo, doggy. So we could literally slot Marquise Brown in with that type of move. Marquise Brown's back in that top. 30 I'll, range I'll trade I'll yeah. trade any I'll trade one eight to one twelve uh maybe maybe, you know, maybe not the quarterback for Holly. Hollywood's already a, a guy that was a big buy for me me and JB just did a show and like, awesome. like right now in our in our ADP I mean he's and he's I'm boosting his ADP up because I'm in a lot of these drafts um he's at like nine nine right now so I, you know I've been I've been robbing getting a lot of um Marquise Brown and, and Christian Kirk um in those ranges but Back to your running back point there of of the next class coming in, which is I think another positive for Jacobs and Barkley is like I don't know that those guys are going to get necessarily have to be feared of one at least one of the big dogs coming in and taking yeah spots exactly for, for two or three years. So uh, you know I think that's that was a good good uh, good point on your end there, but then yeah. just double back on those guys. Yeah, they got absolutely paid. They got big contracts, a lot of guaranteed money up front. That's what you're looking for, right? You're looking for job security for these guys. Saquon, Jacobs, they got it. Gibbs, Brees Hall, Bijan, they all have that 
premium draft capital baked in. Jonathan Taylor got that big contract. So those are the guys you don't have to worry about. But yeah. Kyron Williams might be a guy that you have to worry about that's very highly valued. Mm-hmm. Or you can even get into like the Javante Williams, the Rashad Whites, the Ramondre Stevensons. Like that's the tier where you want to, after this year, you want to get off those guys and just see what happens, right? Like whenever there's a stack class 2017, that class came steaming in. There was like four yeah. rookies, five rookies that year that finishes RB1. So this dude just could see something like that. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a that's a good point. Good good way to look at it. Um, all right, well, we're at the end of this thing, and we got so let's you want to you want to chat a little bit about thoughts on Keenan to the Bears and and thoughts on Hollywood real quick. Yeah, that that even goes to show what we are saying about Caleb Williams, right? That elite fantasy upside. Dude's about to throw to DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, Cole Komet, Gerald Everett, DeAndre Swift. They still have pick nine. It blows my mind. They do. So they have oh, they have their seconds. Like they're going to be able to make a big splash with Caleb Williams. Like is there any world in. where you keep Fields? No, not me neither. Okay, no. just all right. Hollywood Brown to the Chiefs, and then let's get out of here. What are your general thoughts? One year deal. It looks like. I love it for the Chiefs. If Hollywood Brown could stay healthy, I think you could argue he's a better player than Rashi Rice, or he can be a better mm-hmm. player. But I yeah. think that's like for both of them, like the perfect spot for like, if T Higgins comes in, you're like, Oh shit. Like rice that, that sucks. Right. But Hollywood's like that perfect talent where it's like, they can both eat, right? Like n- neither are significantly better than the other. Like they're like a one, a one B. And that's how I think it's going to be. If Hollywood can stay healthy and get his foot healthy, he can be a thousand yard receiver in this chief offense yeah. all day. And he's going to add a different level of, he's going to be in that, Marquis Valdez Scantlin role, but he can actually catch the freaking ball. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, he's he can, a lot he can run more than there. one route too. You yeah. know, um, so I, I agree I with you. They kind of do a little different things, but I think they're 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 good together. Best case scenario for Rashi Rice, I think, as you know, we alluded to it earlier in these. I don't know if it was the twenty three twenty four conversation or this one that if they do bring in a guy, which is something I you know had a question all you know when rice was rising up, he was a big buy for me. And then he got up there and was crushing. And it was like, well, is, should we be selling rice? Like I, maybe in 50, in my portfolio, 50%, I might sell 50% of my, my rice just in case they do add, like they could even add two guys. Like they might even draft, you know, there could be Hollywood's only on a one year deal, but they could also draft somebody here fairly high too. And just, you know, Kelsey's 34 or whatever. Um, so you know, it could could go out the window pretty quick, but I, I love it. That obviously I've been a big Hollywood Brown guy, so that's that's gonna do wonders. It's gonna suck to see where that ADP goes to because it's probably going through the roof. Um, mm-hmm. Even though the Chiefs haven't always, you know, it's really been Rashi Rice and and Tyree Kill. Everybody else has kind of sucked in that landing spot. Yeah, um, yeah. They gave him good money up to eleven million guaranteed. Yeah. So, well, cool. All right, man. You got anything else before we get out of here? No, I'll just say it again. Stay true to your process, but also be fluid throughout it. Like keep evaluating, keep adjusting, and just take values. Uh, if you have 10 rookie picks, you're not forced to make all 10 picks, right? Yeah. Pick who you want, pick who you don't want, trade those picks for established players and build out your roster. Win yourself some money. Don't be a donator. That's a, that's a, we try to stay on two key things. We're trying to win and we're also trying to have fun. I feel like too much. You know, we're, we're always trying to put the fun back in fantasy because I think too much of this shit gets way too serious with some of these dudes. And it's like, dude, we are we are talking about fake football here. Um, yeah, we don't we don't need to be that serious. Let's have some fun and some conversations. My values are different than your values. That's how that's why this works. If it do, if it didn't, exactly. we would never nothing would ever get accomplished. You know, exactly. it would never be any trade. So, um, yeah, it's good. Uh, good ending spiel from from Snoog. Where can we find everything for you, Snoog? Yeah, on Twitter at FF Snoog. You can find all my work and my link tree. I got my Patreon in there, my my podcast, all that good stuff. So check that out. You, all my rankings, I post rookie-wise on Twitter. I'm posting content daily about the draft class, about Dynasty Fantasy Football. During redraft season, I'm posting a lot of redraft content as well. So keeping things versatile and fluid throughout my process and trying to just continue to nail these rookies for everybody i think the wide receivers are going to be the the best positional group and quarterbacks you could argue those two are just going to be so perfect to dial in on a nail so that's what i'm trying to do honestly i don't even care to look at the running backs i'll pick and choose who i want and who's the good values when when i get 
uh, draft capital and landing spots because that's everything for that position is landing spot, honestly, in my opinion. So once I get that, then then we'll lock and load on those running backs as well. And we'll put together some mocks for you guys, super flex, like mocks, one QB, all that good stuff, big boards. So I'm excited. Yeah, you got it. Is it must follow on the, on the Twitters at FF Snoog 20s 1G. Um, you can catch them every Tuesday on the Smash Accept pod. Uh, that should definitely be something that's subscribed one way or another, whether it's on YouTube or Spotify or Google Play or Apple, whatever you got to do. Make sure you're catching everything that's coming out from the Smash guys over there. And and Snoog's personal account is is always a good follow uh, day in, day out. He's he, he doesn't let you down over there. He's always got something for you, whether you agree or disagree. Uh, good yeah, stuff. exactly. So appreciate you. We will uh, catch you guys all next time. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment below. Uh, we got the $5 holler, the Patreon. You get three extra episodes a month, plus the Discord. Um, we're building player pages for rookie stuff. Uh, we got rankings, and we're building ADP. We're going live every other week with the startup mock on the YouTube. So uh, hit us up at the FF Dynasty. We usually throw that out to a couple of uh, public spots at the end, as well as uh, some of those ADP drafts, we like to get some more public in too to just switch it up from the same, you know, 80 patrons tossing things back and forth. So you can get a lot of good stuff over there. Snoog, very much appreciate appreciate all the time and very much looking forward to talking to you maybe after the draft. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to come back on the show and I promise you next time I'll have a nice cold model to crack with you. And some headphones or Jason's going to yeah. lose his uh, headphones. I'll headphones <laughs> Jason finds out where I live and throws yeah. a brick through my window. <laughs> yeah. All right, dude. We'll catch you guys next time. Peace. <laughs>